Folks, good to see you all again. This is the third of three weeks on the death of Christ and the righteousness of God, uh, dealing with Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. Let's open in a word of prayer, shall we? Thank you, Father, for the salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Too often we take it for granted. Too often we may even think that our lives are just regular lives of everyday people when we have been chosen by your mercy to be in your kingdom. We thank you for the Spirit of God who moves in our hearts and guides us and knits our hearts together with one another in love. And we thank you for the truth of the scriptures. Open the eyes of our heart that we might see what Paul has to teach the Romans and to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me begin by telling you about a t-shirt. I, I don't know where this one came from, but there's a site called 1517.com that has great uh, Reformation uh, t-shirts. Now, you folks don't look like you're the t-shirt type. I am definitely the t-shirt type, and this is a new one that I just got that I will be wearing at school every once in a while. The door is fine. It's your theology I'm fixing. <laughs> so I think that's, yeah, I'm just fixing your theology, so I think that's, that's terrific. So anyway, there's uh, one I do wear when I teach this passage at Dallas Seminary, and I unveil it at the moment that we get to verse 24, and I'll tell you about that, but again, tonight I'm not wearing it. So let's begin. Where are we in our study? We are at part 2.5 and part three of three parts. We've given an introduction to Romans. Why did Paul write this letter and what is its relevance to us? We've begun our exposition of Romans, which we got through about verse 22 last time, and the application of Romans to our lives is what we will also be addressing tonight when we finish the exposition. Is faith alone enough to save? And what did Christ's death accomplish? That's the kind of application that I'm talking about. Let me sum up our study so far. The theme of Romans is the vindication of God's righteousness in Paul's gospel. The apostle is just as concerned in this letter to vindicate God's righteousness as he is to explain the gospel. By the way, the notes that you got from last time are what you should be using for tonight because we only went through a part of that. So if you have those, plus the... Um, outline of Romans and the translation, the three different translations on one side, that's what we're looking for. If we can get far enough tonight, I'll pass out this other page. So as I said, the apostle is just as concerned in this letter to vindicate God's righteousness as he is to explain the gospel. He has gone to great lengths to articulate the total depravity of all of humanity, from Adolf Hitler to Mother Teresa from Martin Luther to Martin Luther King, from Osama bin Laden to Dan Duncan. All of us are in the same boat. No one can escape God's righteous wrath by their own works. Romans 3, 21 through 26 lays out the solution to our problem. God's wrath was poured out on his son who died as our substitute. He satisfied God's righteous requirements for all who put their trust in him. We escape eternal torment because Jesus Christ took our place. The perfect standard of God's holiness and righteousness was not lowered in the slightest when he offered salvation in Christ. Remarkably, what I just said is being challenged today within evangelical circles. And we'll see if we can get to that when we get done with the exposition. So let me uh, read the translation. This is the Net Bible modified through our passage, and then we will try to pick up right at verse 23. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, even though it is attested by the law and the prophets, namely the righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. The Net Bible has through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ instead of through faith in Jesus Christ. I gave the arguments last week, and I don't need to go over those again with you. For all who believe, for there is no distinction. Notice there's a period at the end of verse 22, and then verse 23 begins, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, comma, 
Now, those of you who know a little bit about uh, English grammar, and especially those of you who know about Greek grammar, will recognize that the all of verse 23 is still the subject of the participle in verse 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God while being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The all in verse 23, then, are the ones who are redeemed. They are the ones who are justified. Is this everyone in the world? Does this teach universal salvation? We'll get to that here in just a few minutes. Verse 25, God publicly displayed him at his bloody death, that is, displayed Jesus Christ at his bloody death, as the mercy seat. This is translated otherwise in other translations, and we'll discuss that then too. Accessible through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because God and his forbearance had, had passed over the sins previously committed. God passing over sins in the past is not a demonstration of his righteousness. That's why this is a parenthetical point here. Paul resumes the argument in verse 26, and we've added, as I was saying, to show that this is a resumption of the argument. He uses almost exactly the same phrase, the demonstration of his righteousness in verse 25, and he picks it up again and says it almost exactly the same way in verse 26. As I was saying, this was to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just even while justifying the one who lives because of Jesus' faithfulness. Now, there's two differences here from normal or other translations. Even while justifying, I've spent a few hours wrestling with that, whether that's a legitimate translation, and it seems to be uh, rather satisfactory, both grammatically in the Greek and especially in terms of the the, the flow of the argument. Paul's point here is that God's righteousness is completely intact, even though we are justified while being sinners. How could that possibly be? It's because God's righteousness is demonstrated in the death of Jesus Christ. So he would be just, that is, God would be just. He would be righteous, even while declaring us righteous, those who put their faith in the faithful one. So that's a brief translation of the text. Let's take a look at uh, verse 23 then. Starting in a new sentence. For all have sinned. Now, the meaning assumed by most exegetes, evangelists, and others is that the all means everyone, unbelievers and believers alike. In Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, all sinners, in fact, are in view, Gentiles and Jews, the good Gentile, the bad Gentile, the good Jew, the bad Jew, everybody. But I would argue that only believers are really in view in verse 23 here. Part of the reason is that Paul has just defined the all in verse 22, as all who believe. The same all are surely in view here too. Perhaps the reason that most interpreters see the groups as different is that Paul does not qualify the all, that is, those all I just talked about in verse 23, but he does qualify it in verse 22 as all who believe. And yet, Paul has an economic style of writing, especially with the Greek word all where he might say, all who believe, and then he'll just use the word all after that to refer back to that same group. I'm just going to give you the reference. This is not what uh, we'll have a chance to look at, but 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Paul speaks about those all who were baptized in the Red Sea with Moses, and all, and all, and all. He mentions it five or six times, all of them going back to that same group each time, but he doesn't qualify it again. Now, A few years ago, a member of the faculty at Dallas Seminary now was a a student. He was working on his doctorate, Will Johnston, and I was the uh, first reader of his dissertation. It was on the word all in Greek. Now, can you imagine doing that kind of detailed work? I want to study everything about all, so I suggested a title for him, All About All, you know, but he didn't want to go with that. But he, he did a brilliant piece of work that got to be a published monograph, and in it, he actually ended up generating an article that got published in one of the standard journals for New Testament studies, that the all of verse 23 is just believers. After he got this published, he, was, he actually was reading it at a, a scholarly conference that included both Christians and non-Christians. 
the Society of Biblical Literature, which ironically is the largest academic society for the study of the Bible in the world. About 10,000 people congregate someplace in North America every year right before Thanksgiving, and probably 75-80% of them are not believers. I'm not saying they're not evangelical. I'm saying they don't believe in the bodily resurrection of the theanthropic person. So they're far removed from the evangelical faith. And uh, they're the ones who are teaching philosophy and religion and ancient history, Western civilization, in our universities and uh, graduate schools. One of them had just completed a commentary on Romans. I think he is a believer, but he had just done this huge commentary, about 1,200 pages, spent years working on it, and he had come to the conclusion in Romans 3.23, as almost everybody does, the all must mean all people. All people are sinners. Will Johnston read his paper at this society meeting, and Robert Jewett, the man who wrote the commentary, was listening to, to Will, and he said, oh, darn, I now have to revisit that passage. I think you may be right. Here's the point. If the apostle is restricting the all of verse 23 to believers, can we still or this is one point, can we still use this verse in sharing the gospel? I mean, after all, you, you hear about, well, we can't use this verse or that verse, it doesn't mean what we think it means. Here's one where I'd say, absolutely you can, because there's a distinction between meaning and significance that still gets erased at this point. Here's the reason. Although Paul is saying all believers are sinners, in order to become a believer, you have to admit that you're a sinner. He's just established that everybody is sinners. He doesn't need to say that again. So here he's saying all believers are sinners, and if you're not a believer, he's not addressing whether you're a sinner or not, but he just did do that. So if you want to become a believer in Jesus Christ, you can't do it without admitting your sin. In terms of significance, obviously we can share that. I think there's two very important implications about taking the all in verse 23 as restricted to believers here. And one is the second verb of verse 23, which is the Greek word husteruntai, translated, and fall short. And the second implication is found in the next verse. I'll get to these in just a second. When Paul says all have sinned, he uses the aorist tense. It's a summary tense. And what he's really doing is he's describing our lives as one big blob of sin. But that's not all he has to say. He joins this, all of us have sinned, with a present tense where he could have said all have sinned and all have fallen short of God's glory. That's not what the text is saying. Now, sometimes people even render it that way without thinking. In fact, in some major commentaries on Romans, that's how they've translated it, it is as if both are past tense. They're saying, for all have sinned and for all have fallen short of God's glory. That's not what the Greek is saying. It's saying that all of us have sinned and all of us still fall short of God's glory. Now, this is going to be important because Paul is talking about believers. The verb husteruntai, which is a present tense here from hustereo, is a customary present. It means fail to reach or sometimes completely lack. It's used in the story of the wedding at Cana in John chapter 2, verse 3. The wine failed, or it fell short, of satisfying the wedding guest's thirst. Probably because Jesus' disciples at this time were just fishermen, and you know how much fishermen drink, and they, they weren't really invited to the wedding. Well, I won't go in there. Anyway, as a present tense, it indicates that although all believers have sinned, all believers still now fail to reach God through our own righteousness. We habitually fall short of God's glory is one way to render this. We are in a perpetual state of failure. In other words, we are still totally depraved sinners. Everyone in this room still is. We can't claim that, well, we have sinned and now we're doing just fine. That's not what Paul's allowing. All believers have sinned and all believers still continue to fall short of the glory of God which here is talking about being in his presence, and it's uh, referring to his holiness. Paul will mention this again, the same phrase in Romans 5, 2, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It has a past look back to the Garden of Eden and a future look that we will be with God in eternity 
and we will see his glory, and we will not be burned up because of it. But Paul is setting up a significant tension here in verse 23. Those who believe in Jesus Christ are those who have sinned and those who continue to fall short of the glory of God. Well, how can we be saved? That's what he's going to answer in the next verse. James Edwards, in his commentary on Romans, sums up the significance of this verse. In all scripture, there is probably no verse which captures the essence of Christianity better than this one. Here is the heart of the gospel, the mighty nevertheless, the momentous divine reversal. Everything in verse 23 was due to humanity. Everything in verse 24 depends on God. The verse starts by saying, while being justified. It's a participle in Greek, and by far the most natural way to read this text is to see, as I've said, the all of verse 23 as the all who are also being justified in verse 24. And since the all has already been predefined as believers, I'm, I'm, I know I'm being repetitive, I want to make sure you understand the point I'm making, though. Since the all of verse 23 has already been predefined as believers only, Paul can say that all believers are being justified. If the all had not been predefined, and if he meant all people are being freely justified, I think we'd have a problem, because that would mean universal salvation and the death of Christ becomes somewhat irrelevant. At least faith in Christ becomes irrelevant. But that's not at all what Paul says. By the way, it was this juxtaposition of verses 23 and 24 that I think drove Luther to his famous aphorism, simul justus et peccator, simultaneously just and a sinner. Now that's a t-shirt that I like to wear at this point, and I unveil it in class, and I unbutton my Hawaiian shirt, which is what I always wear, and then they see me wearing another shirt underneath, and I tell them, go to 1517.com. You can get simul justus et peccator. Unfortunately, it's late ecclesiastical Latin with a J instead of an I for justus, but you can't, can't win them all. Simultaneously just and a sinner. We are both sinners and saints. We are both always continually failing to reach the glory of God. Not one of us in this room is getting one step closer by our own efforts. And yet, by our status, we are already there because of the death of Christ. So, Paul is saying that all believers are falling short of God's glory, and while they are falling short, they are justified. What does it mean to be justified? Roman Catholics and Protestants, as you might have guessed, are divided over this issue. But within Protestantism, there are more divisions coming that have just arisen in the last few years, and one of the fundamental reasons for it is that these scholars are not looking at what the Greek text actually says. Luther did. He was teaching Romans uh, between 1516 and 1517 for about 18 months every Monday and Friday morning in Wittenberg for an hour and a half. And in the middle of that, that's when Erasmus's Greek New Testament got published, March 1st, 1516. And Luther got that Greek New Testament and it revealed to him the gospel. And then 20 months almost to the day later, he posts his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg church. Catholicism generally regards justification to mean imparted righteousness. It's a phrase I want you to write down. Catholicism means imparted righteousness. While Protestants generally take it to mean imputed righteousness. I'll explain the difference. Catholics take the, when, it's, when they say God justifies the sinner, God makes righteous the sinners, what imparted righteousness would mean. For Protestants, God justifies the sinner means God declares righteous the sinner. The difference is important. If imparted, then God makes us righteous. If it's imputed, then God declares us to be righteous. Does that mean for Protestants that God does not make us righteous? It means that he hasn't done that completely yet. That's a part of sanctification. Justification is what happens at the front end. Our status has changed. God declares us righteous. 
And then sanctification, the process, or salvation in the present tense, is us getting closer and closer. And yet, ironically enough, for many of us, for most of us, if we're growing properly in Christ, we feel in some ways farther and farther away from the Lord, in that our sins devastate us much more than they did before, as they should. Ultimately, God will make us righteous, and that's glorification, the future tense of salvation, where all of our sins, the presence of sin, the power of sin, the penalty of sin, all will be gone when we meet our Lord Jesus Christ in eternity. If righteousness is imparted, then there's no assurance of salvation, since God does not make us righteous immediately. And the implication is that he might not fully do so. Therefore, there's no assurance of salvation in Roman Catholicism. That's why they don't have this assurance. If it means he imputes his righteousness, then there is indeed assurance of salvation because the legal declaration of our righteousness is the divine statement about our status, not about our practice. To justify here almost surely must mean to declare righteous. And here's one of the reasons why. The all who believe, verse 22, are also the all who have sinned and who continue to fall short of the glory of God, verse 23. And those who fall short are also those who are justified while they are falling short. Simul justus et peccator. This can only naturally mean that God declares us righteous before him. If it meant that he makes us righteous, Paul would not have used the present tense to say that we are falling short. We are still falling short. But his subordination of the present participle dikaiumenoi, which is translated while being justified, to the present indicative verb hustaruntai, are falling short, so that both of these happen concurrently, is clear indication that justification must be other than imparted righteousness. I'll give you an illustration that is an illustration actually based on a key Greek word that Paul uses here, I think that should clear clear this up for you, but such an important issue for us to wrestle with, and it's one that so many Christians have forgotten about, to be able to articulate what it is that saves them, why Christ's death atones for their sins, and in what sense it does, is very important for us. Paul adds the word freely. He's just claimed that all believers are falling short of God's glory, while simultaneously being declared righteous. He's going to add three phrases to this while being justified that cement his argument. I had argued earlier that in verse 22, Paul's, and I've mentioned this elsewhere, Paul has an economic style of writing. But when he thinks that he might not be clearly understood, then he compounds what he's saying in different words. And so, after saying dikaiumenoi, being justified, he adds the word freely. We are justified freely, or as some have it, translated as a gift. Then he adds, by his grace. One of the, Paul's key terms, by his grace. But doesn't this mean that God freely, by his grace, enables believers, that he makes us righteous? At this point in Paul's argument, it's possible to read the text this way. It's possible, but it's just barely possible. The apostle will put the nail in the coffin with the next phrase showing that his meaning is that God imputes his righteousness at the point of conversion. He does not impart his righteousness when we first believe. For Catholics, there's no distinction between justification and sanctification. God imparts his righteousness, but it's a a gradual thing. It's part of it right now, and then they grow and grow into, into righteousness. For Protestants, the two are distinct and yet inseparable. God justifies us at the point of our conversion, and then he saves us continually through the process of sanctification until we get to glorification. Paul adds the final phrase, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God declares us righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The word redemption is a compound word that strengthens the underlying force of it. It's it's apolutrosis. It is a word that comes from the slave market. When a person was redeemed, he was set free from his slavery. This was done by a purchase, which in our case was Christ's sacrifice. Now here's the point. 
If I set a slave free, does that mean I immediately change his character or just his status? I immediately change his status. Will he not be grateful for that freedom? Will his character not grow into his status? That is going to happen as well. That's why justification, which is the declaration that somebody is now set free in one sense, happens at the same moment that sanctification begins. I change his status immediately. I change his character progressively. You see the difference? Justification and sanctification. The language of verse 24 speaks eloquently of the fact of setting us free, the apolutrosis, having been or being freely justified by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If Paul had meant that God makes us righteous, he most likely would have said something like being justified through the energizing work of God in your lives. And he uses verbs that mean energize elsewhere when he speaks about progressive salvation or sanctification. But he doesn't say that here. He juxtaposes our continuing sinfulness and God's continuous, unbroken declaration that we are accounted righteous. Paul has just gone to great lengths to show that we are sinners who simply cannot please God by our own efforts. If all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, then how can anyone add to the work of Christ on the cross? The locus of our redemption is in the cross work of Jesus Christ. It is a redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is an emphatic <coughs> phrase in the Greek. Paul never speaks of our redemption as something that is independent of Christ. It's not something that we can accomplish on our own. We cannot buy our way out of the slave market. Slaves in that day could, but we can't. We have to be redeemed by another. No indulgences, no trips to the Vatican on our knees, no acts of piety, no good deeds, no church memberships, no great personal sacrifices, no Bible reading, no anything that we do can redeem us. Our redemption is in Christ and in Christ alone. This is one of the most precious truths in all of Scripture. When we're saved, God first and foremost changes our status. He looks at the shed blood of Christ and he regards Christ's death as the perfect work the perfect sacrifice that covered all of our sins, past, present, and future. And of course, all of them at that time were future because we weren't born yet. We are justified to use Paul's language even while we are sinners, even while we are continuously falling short of God's glory. To put this another way, our salvation does not depend on our works at all. There is not a single work we can do or a group of works that we can do to get ourselves saved and no work that we can do to keep ourselves saved. We're declared righteous before God, our judge, because Christ has paid the price for our sin. Here we are in this courtroom. We come before God as our judge. And in the existential crisis that each of us has, we recognize our own sinfulness and we put our trust in Christ. The Lord Jesus is both our advocate and the one who redeemed us with his own blood. The judge then pronounces the verdict not guilty. And when the trial is finished, he takes off his judge's robes and he adopts us into his own family. We are his because we are in Christ. Some of you may be clinging to your own righteousness or you may be trying to mix your righteousness, your good deeds, your Bible study with the work of Christ. If you think that you will ever get into God's presence, by adding anything to the work of Christ, then you're going in the other direction. And as Lewis Johnson used to do in this church on Sunday mornings, I appeal to you, now is the day of your salvation. Don't think that because you're a good person in your own eyes, that's going to cut it with God. Verse 25. Liberal theology has always resisted this notion of Jesus suffering the wrath of God for our sakes. 23 years ago, I contracted encephalitis. I came home one day, it was 1997, March, 
and I came home from school and I drove my car into the garage and when I say I drove my car into the garage I drove it right into the very back of the garage hit it I had a, a brand new for me new 10 year old BMW that had 110,000 miles on it the air conditioning didn't work it cost me four thousand dollars and it's the first car I ever owned with a tachometer five different tones of blue paint it had been in so many different accidents, but to me, it was, it was very special. So for me to drive my car into the back of the garage, something was amiss. And I told my wife, I said, is Bill Clinton the president? I wasn't sure. He'd been president for a few years already. She saw that some things were wrong, so she took me to see the doctor. The doctor then asked me some other questions, and I all of a sudden could not sit up on the table in, the, in his office. I just, I, I, I couldn't move. So instead of letting me go, go home, he put me into the hospital. Four days later, when I came out, I was in a wheelchair, and I was in a wheelchair for the next year. I lost quite a bit of my memory. Uh, I lost uh, much of my languages, ancient languages, modern languages. Twice I didn't know my own name. Once I didn't know my wife's name. I was in five different hospitals, ended up at Mayo Clinic, and they saved my life, I think. But in that first hospital, I was there for four days, and uh, I wanted to visit with the chaplain. Not because I was concerned at all for my salvation. That was not the issue in any sense. I just wanted to talk to somebody about the Bible, who might know something about the Bible. So this um, woman came in, I think she was a Methodist, that's uh, nothing against Methodists, but in her case, maybe, maybe so. <laughs> but, uh, so we talked about what Jesus accomplished on the cross, and I said, he died in our place to pay completely for our sins, and God raised him from the dead to demonstrate the satisfaction of that payment. And she said, that's cosmic child abuse. What's the alternative to that? God was helpless to prevent the death of Christ? Or maybe he simply allowed it? Either he's not a strong enough God or he's not a good enough God to prevent it. For liberal theology, Christ died as an example for us to follow and no more. And this view is now seeping into evangelical theology. But note what verse 25 says. God publicly displayed him at his bloody death as the mercy seat. What was publicly displayed? It was the hilasterion. Most translations have this as something like as a propitiation, that's what the ESV has, or as an atoning sacrifice, which means the same thing as what the NIV has for the Greek word hilasterion. Now, a fairly recent doctoral dissertation done at Cambridge University argued that propitiation is an improper translation here. The student spent 12 years on his dissertation. He's a graduate of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. A friend of mine, his name is Dan Bailey. And after 12 years of study, he came to a very simple conclusion. You'd think, my gosh, that's a lot of time to come to a one-sentence conclusion. A hilasterion is always a thing, never an idea or an action or an animal. His professor was the Lady Margaret Chair of Divinity at Cambridge University, and after about 11 years, he finally convinced her that he was right. I think that's when he decided, okay, I can get the dissertation now. I, I got her convinced. The only other time this particular word occurs in the New Testament is in Hebrews 9.5, and there it must mean mercy seat. The author is describing the, the furniture in the, in the uh, sanctuary. The language is, of course, here metaphorical, but it moves in one direction. Christ is not the literal mercy seat, of course, but he represents it. And the mercy seat was, get this, was where mankind could stand in the presence of God. In the Holy of Holies, on the Day of Atonement, one day a year, as that high priest represented the nation of Israel. Later rabbinic sources suggest that when the temple still stood, a rope may have been tied around the waist of the high priest, 
We don't know if that actually ever happened, but we do know that later rabbinic sources talked about it. And the fact is that what this tells us is how the Jews viewed the terrifying prospect of standing in God's presence. If that high priest did something wrong, it's all over. He's dead. Who's going to go in and get the body? That's kind of a, a tricky thing. So they would tie the rope around his waist, so we were told, because they knew that it was a terrifying thing to stand in the presence of God and do anything that was incorrect. Why was the mercy seat publicly displayed? That is, Christ as the mercy seat publicly displayed. The imagery says what the Gospels say, and it says more than that. The temple curtain, we read, in the Gospels was torn from top to bottom, revealing that access to God is now available to all. In the Gospels, God's involvement in the severing of the curtain is implied, but not stated. That is God's involvement. It's implied because it's from the top to bottom, 15 feet tall. Even Arnold couldn't pull that curtain down, and it's about six inches thick. I don't think he could do that one either. And yet here, in Romans 3.25, notice that God is explicitly mentioned as the active agent of this public display. God the Father was not weakly acquiescing to the authority of Pontius Pilate, he was not merely allowing his own son to be crucified. The verb translated publicly displayed is proethita from protithemi. It's a middle voice verb. And the emphasis is on the subject's involvement every bit as much as it is on the verb itself. God was not distant. This is not mere permission. But it involves his personal involvement to publicly display Jesus Christ as the mercy seat. That's really stunning, isn't it? Romans 3.25 vividly shows that in Christ all have free access to God. And since all of us come to the mercy seat directly, there is no longer any need for priests. But this passage and many others also tell us much more. The priest standing in front of the holy place on that day in A.D. 30 or A.D. 33, the day our Lord was crucified, offering their sacrificial lambs on the Day of Atonement must have been terrified by the sight of the curtain ripping and revealing the mercy seat. In a sense, we too should feel that way. God has revealed himself to us in his Son, and unless we accept this gift of God, sacrificing his own Son on our behalf, we cannot be saved. That's why Paul adds, accessible through faith. It's essential. He goes on and he says to demonstrate his righteousness because God in his forbearance had passed over the sins previously committed. The rest of verse 25 is making a more subtle point. The public display of the mercy seat is not a demonstration of God's righteousness in the past. That's why we put that part in parentheses. Rather, God in his forbearance passed over the sins previously committed only because they would not remain swept under the rug forever. As the author to the Hebrews said in chapter 10, verse 4, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. These sacrifices are but a shadow of the reality of Christ's death, just like the holy of holies on earth is but a shadow of the real one in heaven. They are a shadow of the reality of his death, of the final sacrifice, the once for all a sacrifice that swept away our sins. Paul goes on in verse 26, the public display of Christ as the mercy seat was to demonstrate God's righteousness at the present time so that he would be just even while justifying the one who lives because of Jesus' faithfulness. This passage overall is teaching that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone, the all-sufficient Passover lamb who died on our behalf and in our place. The value of your faith, the value of my faith, can be no greater than the object of that faith. We should not be putting so strong an emphasis on faith that we forget about the object of that faith. We are declared righteous before God when we put our faith in the faithful one. He looks on us as though we were his own dear son. But if we do not believe in him, there's no hope for us. I would like to add an addendum that I have one page outlined. 
This addendum is called, Did God Pour His Wrath Out on His Son? As I said, liberal theology has said that God did not pour his wrath out on his son. In recent years, the Reformation doctrine of penal satisfaction, that Christ suffered God's wrath in our place, has been challenged from within the evangelical faith. And this challenge is coming from many quarters. I wasn't sure if I wanted to pass this out ahead of time or not because I, I just didn't know if we'd be able to get to this, but this is so rich, it's hard to, hard to pass this up to think about some of these issues. And it's also disturbing to think about some of this stuff and where evangelicalism is headed. So the Reformation doctrine of penal satisfaction that Christ suffered God's wrath in our place has been challenged recently from within the evangelical faith. In April 2012, two days before Good Friday, where we normally see all the stuff on TV and in magazines and the newspaper and radio against the resurrection of Jesus or against the Christian faith, that's when liberal theology comes out and they, they love to uh, destroy Christian faith. An editor in Christianity Today, an editor of Christianity Today, the flagship magazine of the evangelical faith wrote an article called, He's Calling for Elijah, Why We Still Mishear Jesus. The article argued that we've gotten the meaning of the cross all wrong. The author begins the essay with these words, Is God the kind of God that turns his back on his son? Does God abandon those who cry out to him? How could God forsake the perfect God-man, the only one who has ever served him perfectly? Because if Jesus was truly forsaken by God, what's preventing God from forsaking any of us? That's Christianity today. How could we ever trust him to be good? The essay went viral among evangelical Christians, especially younger evangelical Christians. <coughs> The author goes on to state that God did not turn his back on his son. He did not forsake the perfect God-man. He did not pour his wrath out on Jesus Christ as he hung on a cross. The same year, 2012, a theologian at one of the most prestigious evangelical seminaries in the world wrote a book on just this topic, and it was published by InterVarsity Press. The title is Forsaken. It's about the death of Christ and the Godhead. And then three years later, in 2015, a New Testament scholar at an evangelical school in Texas authored a scholarly article which reinterprets one of the key texts in support of this penal satisfaction. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, because it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. This is the verse that this scholar reinterpreted. And this passage is not at all about God putting the curse of death on Jesus for our sake, he argued. Other evangelical leaders in various contexts in the last few years have thrown their hat in the ring for this as well. And this is, I think, an alarming trend within the evangelical church. I had never seen it before 2012. Now, I can only touch on these issues briefly. And if this is as far as we go for this series, I think it's, it's going to be adequate. I hope. Maybe I'll come back and finish this, but it's only, it won't be much time. First of all, major arguments against God's wrath falling on Jesus. The Reformation and child abuse. We've already talked about this. These are arguments against God's wrath falling on Jesus. Let me clarify this. These are the folks within evangelicalism who are saying this against the Reformed doctrine of penal satisfaction. These first arguments are the ones that uh, I would say I don't agree with, and I'm quite confident the, the church, Believer's Chapel, does not agree with. But the first argument, Reformation and child abuse, is that the old reform view of the cross looks too much like cosmic child abuse. We're listening to old dead white guys from the 16th century. Let's get beyond that. And this understanding of the gospel, the view held by Luther, Calvin, Edwards, Spurgeon, Bart, and a host of Protestant theologians for 500 years is bad. And if it's bad, then it's also false. That's how they view this. Second, Psalm 22.1 on the lips of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is quoted in Matthew 24, uh, 27.46 and Mark 15.34. 
And what is said is that there is hope at the end of the psalm, which there surely is, that God would rescue the psalmist. In the ESV, at Psalm twenty-two twenty-four, it says, For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has, no, he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. The argument goes that Psalm 22, 1 should be understood to mean that God only seemed to abandon his son because there is hope at the end of the psalm. What's interesting is the major assumption is that although this view claims that the whole psalm must be in view when Jesus uttered these words from the cross, the argument is that the whole psalm except verse 1 is in view. In the Christianity Today article, the author said, here is direct refutation of the notion that the father turned his face away from the son. Jesus is not saying that God has forsaken him. He's declaring the opposite. He's saying that God is with him, even in this time of seeming abandonment, and that God will vindicate him by raising him from the dead. Now, I'm not going to address this argument any further because, frankly, it's a very weak argument, but I'll deal with some other arguments uh, against this general view. Third, the point of Jesus' suffering. This is one of the most alarming things about all of this. If Jesus did not die in our place, if he did not receive the full force of God's wrath against sin, then what did he accomplish on the cross? For the author of this Christianity Today article, the point of the cross was for us to know that we are not alone in our suffering. And the author is bold enough to say the following, there is nothing in Scripture that says that the Father rejected the Son. This might come as quite a shock to the majority of Christians since the Reformation who have held otherwise. In this view, Christ's death is exemplary, but not expiatory. That is, it's just an example for us to follow. The supreme example, of course, but that's as far as it goes. It does not have saving value. Fourth, the unity of God. This is the primary argument in the InterVarsity Press book, and it goes like this. If the Father turned his back on Jesus, then the Trinity is broken. If God is immutable, this simply cannot happen. In this approach, all the statements in Scripture that seem to put God as the ultimate active agent in the death of Christ simply cannot mean what they seem to mean. God only permitted Christ to die. That's a very quick overview of a variety of sources, and let me give you some arguments for God's wrath falling on Jesus. I, I, frankly, I was so stunned when I saw that Christianity Today piece that immediately I posted a response and I think I called it Jesus in the hands of a wishy-washy God, something like that. I'm not sure, but um, that's on my blog, danielbwallace.com. But uh, nevertheless, let me give you some arguments that I think are very clearly taught in Scripture that God's wrath fell on Jesus Christ. Number one is Paul, the Deuteronomic curse, and his gospel. We've discussed this in the last two weeks, that Paul, both before and after he was a believer, believed that the curse in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, is that everyone who dies on a tree is cursed by God. And consequently, as a non-believer, he would say, how could God bless this man by raising him from the dead if we know that he cursed him by hanging him on a tree? As a Christian, he came to recognize, because of the Damascus Road experience, that God did bless this man by raising him from the dead. And now I've got to figure out how he could possibly do it. Because Paul, for his whole life, was always a biblicist. He had to figure out how the Bible could not be contradictory. And when he was a Pharisee attacking the Christians, he thought that their view unraveled all of Old Testament scripture. It basically said God lied. So I won't get into the arguments there any further. That's what we covered in the last two weeks. But the second argument, the Godhead, dealing with the unity of God. The Godhead is one in purpose in the death of Christ. We must not think that God the Father wanted to pour out his wrath on us, but Jesus thwarted the Father's almighty hand by appeasing him with his own death. It's a false dichotomy to suppose that Jesus' death caused the Father 
to repent of his destructive intentions. It's a false dichotomy to just suppose that God hates us, but Jesus loves us. Nor should we think that the father wrung his hands and said, Oh no, these people are sinners. What will we do? Rather, from eternity past, the father and son planned on this ultimate sacrifice, both of them entering into the arrangement joyfully and freely, even though in the historical event there was unimaginable pain, excruciating pain, as both father and son, along with the spirit, suffered in ways that we can never grasp. I won't address how God can suffer in relationship to the doctrine of impassibility, but that's, that would be for another time. The son, as Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, went to the cross willingly. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, Paul says. This was not cosmic child abuse, but a loving God who redeemed sinners by executing his own son, who obeyed the Father willingly and joyfully. Would the Father allow his son to die such a horrible death if it did not pay for our sins? That would be cosmic child abuse, to say, well, it's just an example for us to follow. Because that view can only treat Christ's death as exemplary, not expiatory. That is, as an example, not as pain for our sins. As a model for us, but not as a substitute for us. And there are other texts that speak equally of the unity of the Godhead in the death of Christ. Romans 5.8 tells us that God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Father and the Son were united in the execution of the Son. The Father's love is seen in him crucifying his own Son. In John's Gospel, we see repeatedly that Jesus was going to give up his life willingly. Now let me sum this up in terms of the unity of the Godhead. The death of Christ is not cosmic child abuse because, first of all, the Father and Son mutually agreed that the death of Christ was necessary. Second, the Father sent the Son to die for us. I'm going to go a little slower because these are important points. The death of Christ is not cosmic abuse for four reasons. First, the Father and Son mutually agreed that Christ's death was necessary. Second, the Father sent his Son to die for us. Third, it's a false dichotomy to claim that the Father hates us, but Christ loves us. Since the Father's love is explicitly claimed as the reason why God sacrificed his Son for us. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that amazing? Romans 5.8. It's a false dichotomy to claim that the Father hates us, but Christ loves us, since the Father's love is explicitly claimed as the reason why God sacrificed his Son for us. And fourth, the resurrection of Jesus Christ obliterates the cosmic child abuse notion. If Jesus were not raised from the dead, that would be cosmic child abuse. And my liberal chaplain friend at the hospital believed, apparently, that Jesus did not rise from the dead. If that's the case, it would be cosmic child abuse, or that God is powerless, or that he's just not a very good God. But the resurrection changes all that. The third general argument has to do with Isaiah chapter 53, which is kind of looked at all too briefly or not at all by some of these authors. In Isaiah 53, a passage that early Christians regarded as messianic, we can see this in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 35, for example, Jesus' suffering on the cross was seen. Let me just read from verses 4 through 6 and part of verse 10 out of the ESV. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6 and verse 10. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. 
but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. How is it possible to not see that the father was orchestrating the suffering and the death of his own son in light of a passage like this? And fourth is the Greek word paradidomi. Say that 12 times fast. I gave you the uh, transliteration. It means to betray or to hand over. In certain contexts, it can have a different meaning. But when it has to do with something that's negative, this is its force. God did not simply allow Jesus to die on one of the most horrific torture devices ever concocted so that Jesus could sympathize with our suffering. Peter declares on the day of Pentecost, Jesus was, quote, handed over, paradidomi, by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. The foreknowledge of God is based on the predetermined plan, not the other way around. It's not as if God looks down the annals of history and that's how he knows and then he plans. It's just the opposite. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 23. So in Peter's Pentecost message, he's saying God handed over or betrayed the Son by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And the verb translated delivered up or handed over or betrayed is paradidomi. This is the same verb that's used in Mark chapter 9, verse 31. When the Lord himself, Jesus says, the Son of Man will be betrayed or handed over into the hands of men. There are numerous passages that speak of Jesus being betrayed or handed over to be crucified by his enemies. And there are some that speak of God as orchestrating the entire event. Several speak of God the Father handing him over, or they use the divine passive where the only possible agent could be God. The divine passive is where the passive voice is used. It implies an agent, but the agent is not stated. Let me give you uh, one example uh, among many. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He, that is Jesus, was handed over because of our transgressions. He was betrayed. He was delivered up. He was handed over. Paradidomi is the verb. Because of our transgressions. Now, obviously this is talking about the death of Christ. Did the Roman authorities hand over Jesus? Did the Jewish authorities hand, them, hand him over to Rome and vice versa because of our transgressions? Was that their motive? Oh, these people have sinned. We've got to crucify Jesus. That, it has nothing to do with that. The agent must be God the Father. He's the one who handed Jesus over because of our transgressions. And then this is made explicit in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, speaking of God the Father and the Son, and we're seeing exactly the same verb, paradidomi. He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Romans 8.32. The he is God. God is not required to love us in the first place. You know that. And yet proof of his ongoing love is found in the cross of Christ because it is on that basis that we all, regardless of who we are, come to him in faith. And then because of that unspeakably horrifying and yet awesome act, God also lavishes his love on us forever. As Wayne Grudem puts in his Systematic Theology, God the Father, the mighty creator, the Lord of the universe, poured out on Jesus the fury of his wrath. Jesus became the object of the intense hatred of sin and vengeance against sin, which God had patiently stored up since the beginning of the world. At the cross, the fury of all that stored up wrath against sin was unleashed against God's own son. Should it shock us that Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But before we think that God conspired with evil men to betray Jesus, we are reminded that, as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, the Son of God loved me, 
and gave himself up for me. Again, paradidomi. Once again, this verb is used. The crucifixion was not cosmic child abuse. Jesus willingly, obediently went to the cross. In a sense, the Lord betrayed himself in that he willingly went to the cross in our place. But as you know, the story doesn't end there. Jesus conquered death. He rose triumphantly from the grave. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. All of us on planet Earth have a choice. We can worship Jesus Christ now and later or just later because every knee in heaven, on the earth, and under the, knee, uh, under the earth will bow at the name of Jesus. They won't be forced to. They will be compelled to by the magnificence and the glory of the Son of God. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ now, you will be worshiping him later because his magnificence will not be hidden. Now is the time. Thank you very much.